Welcome. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Cabosport, Pennsylvania. We want you to be a part of our worship service, and we are conscious of the fact that it is very difficult for people to worship together during this COVID virus, and because of fear of contagion, that we have been worshiping online. I want you to know that the session met this month, earlier in the, in the month, and we discussed what we were going to do as a congregation. And the decision that we made at that point was to wait until the beginning of June and then decide again as a session who makes the decisions for the congregation, who have been appointed by the congregation to, to decide these things. We will decide when we'll reopen. And we pray God's wisdom to be with us during that time. But I want to encourage you to know and to realize that whatever decision we make, it's always done through prayer. And we as a session, as a congregation, have been in prayer about what we should do. And what's utmost in our decision-making process is the safety of the congregation and that we follow the will of Jesus Christ. I want you to know, though, that the church is not closed. The building might be empty, but the church is active. We're out in the community, and as best as we can, ministry is still being done. We miss each of you, and it is a hard thing for us to not gather together. But it would be worse if one of our community of faith were to come down with the virus because of the actions of someone in this congregation. So with prayer and education, we will try to make that decision as soon as possible, and we'll let you all know. We continue to ask you to pray for our community of faith, and we ask that you would let Warren, Pastor Warren or myself, know if there's any prayer concerns or anything that we can do to help you. Let us begin our worship service through the ministry of our Director of Music, Chris Heatherly, as she ministers to us through the prayer. Jesus Christ has called and consecrated us as citizens of your new world. We confess our failure to fulfill our calling. You call us towards a world of justice and peace, service and compassion, integrity and faithfulness, joy and hope. Yet we remain captive to injustice and violence. 
self-seeking and hatred, expediency and deceit, sickness, discouragement, and despair. Forgive. Forgive our wavering trust in and weak commitment to your victory in Jesus Christ. Through your great grace, consecrate us anew for the fulfillment of your purposes. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. This morning we will be reading from the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter, beginning at the 5th verse, and reading on through the 19th verse. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those who you gave me out to the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that that may be one and as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the ones doomed to destruction, so the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world, any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth, for your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them, them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in my sight, my strength, and my redeemer. Amen. The 
There were words from a dying woman. I am so afraid not for myself, nor do I fear death. I'm afraid for my children and for what we have left behind for them. I hate to leave them all alone in this world. And then she prayed for them. How does one pray for those that we are leaving behind? It's an evil and hostile world, and yet we know that we will not be here always, and we'll be leaving many behind. How do we show them to be strong, to grow wise? How do we pray? that they're spared of suffering, that they have some hope, that they are free from sickness, failure, and conflict. This is a predicament Christ was in. He was about to ascend into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father only. And yet he was leaving his his disciples behind, knowing that they were his children, that he had taught about the world, but he could no longer be with them. And so Christ prayed for his disciples before he left, that they be purified, that they be preserved for sacred use, and that they may eventually be made one with God. Doing something good for and in this world, in the eyes of my generation, generation after me, and those coming even after that, somehow has given way to narcissism. A personal gratification. People no longer seem totally motivated for self-fulfillment. They're lacking of motivating of, for other people, of giving to others. But everything's wanting for ourselves to bring it in, to keep it, and not share. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of that we're born into this world and we're going to get the most out of it that we can. And in some ways that's good. It challenges us. But maybe we've tipped the balance too far. Nothing seems to motivate us toward moral excellence and social responsibility. And this is certainly a general generalization. There are people out there that do wonderful things and have given their lives. I think of all the, the health workers and, and the many people of this world that have given so much of themselves. But right now we seem out of balance. That there is that selfishness rather than selflessness. Jesus' disciples were facing a transition. Jesus had told them that he will no longer be with them, that he will be ascending to the Father. And what held them together was Jesus. And it had to be in Jesus' mind, are they all going to fall apart and no longer be one? Now that they're on their own, are they going to would they lose their identity and wander, get lost, have no community? It's rather depressing, but I think many people that are facing death and dying wonder that very thing about their own children and their loved ones that they leave behind. It's sad. 
the vi virus isolation that we've faced, not just here in this part of the world, but throughout the whole world, where we've had to isolate and separate from each other, I think has made it even worse, because now we're kind of out for ourselves to get everything we can. Toilet paper, masks, whatever it is that we want. We want to make sure we have ours, and we don't really care a whole lot whether the rest have theirs. I want more out of life than that. I've realized I can't do it alone. I don't have the power to be that single individual that makes it and makes it high on the hill. I want to make it to the promised land, but I don't want to be there alone. I want to be there with others. In our aloneness, we seem to re be reminded that truly we're not alone. We have a sense of call, and Jesus reminds us that in the scripture today. In a sense, he consecrates his disciples to move on with life, to take on responsibility and not privilege. We've been given great opportunity in our own country and in many countries to be the moral light to the nations. The familiar phrase where we don't put our candle under the bushel, but on the bushel, so that it can be a beacon to the world. We've sort of lost that. In the early church, during horrible times of persecution, and those times maybe were even worse than what we're facing, can you imagine facing the lion's den, fighting off wild animals while people sat there laughing and were being entertained, these early Christians that died for their faith? The church's initial calling and consecration was to persecution, but that persecution intensified their conviction. It made the early Christians strong, and they bonded together in oneness. From out of a mess of scattered Christians, they were brought together and helped each other. Persecution often intensifies. Intensifies one's own convictions and one's community's convictions. They've been, set, they've been set apart by God as God's agents, agents of reconciliation, of love, of modeling what life should be like in the world. That's our task, too. We've been called to that task. Jesus speaks in this scripture today to us who were left behind but called to God. The church does not receive special favors from God or special protection. You can be a Christian and still die of the COVID virus or cancer or any other things. You're still in accidents. There is no protection just because we wear this armor of being a Christian. But we have a strength that gets us through. And by sharing and living that strength, the next generation learns of that strength, and it is passed from one to another. We're called to be agents of justice, of righteousness. We're called to be morally and ethically excellent. So when we emerge from out of the moral muddle, become examples for the rest of the world. 
America has often been thought to be that way. Things may have changed. I'm not sure that we still hold that same status. But with our strength, our abilities, and all that we can offer, that can be built up again. There was a man eating in a soup kitchen, and another man came and sat down beside him. He was a reporter. And then a third man came down and sat down beside him. And he was a, a cleric. And the clergy person knew the gentleman that was at the soup kitchen because he was there almost every week eating there. He knew his name, nicknamed him Captain. And so he said, Captain, how are you doing this week? What is this week like for you? And is there anything the church can do for you other than providing you with this meal? How can we help you to improve your life and make it easier for you? Surely there's more that we can do than provide this simple meal. And Captain answered, there really isn't much religion can do anymore. Religion has lost its control on folk. This is coming from the man at the soup kitchen. It no longer controls people from their insides, from their hearts. It controls us from the outside. Money, power, prestige. These are things that we see when we look at the church anymore. It's not the heart and the soul that we need. If we don't feel responsible to God for what task he has left us in his ascension, to feel responsible to pass on to the next generation what it will be like and to give them hope and courage, we have failed our task then that Jesus has put before us. Many of those on the streets have little to look toward. What do they want to go with God for? And sometimes, even in our pews, what do people have to look forward to? This is a sad situation. Jesus prayed that we would not be taken out of the world, but that we would remain in the world. These are the words of John. I am leaving, but these people are staying within the world. The world that you gave to me spoke to his father. Our mission is this world. But our citizenship is to God's world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed and continually renewed by this world, by others around us, by those that do good things, those that show us God's love just by their living and their example. That's what we're called to do. That's what Jesus left the task for us to do, was to love just as he loved. If you remember, his commandment was to love one another as I have loved you. Have we been doing that? Has that been what we've really been doing over these many, many years? We are citizens of the world, God's world, a new heaven and a new earth. God is forever calling us to live for that world, 
not to accumulate as much as we can in this world. We're called to live for the now as people of God in God's world. The now isn't here and now. The now is what God will bring to us and make us whole. The message is that God's new world will come. God will triumph. And we take a stake in our lives on it. And should depend on it. It's in our Holy Scripture. And if we think and pray about it, it's in our holy minds. We want what God wants for us. But so often it gets all scrambled up and we think we want what we want is best for us. The one who proclaimed that the disciples would remain in the world has overcome the world. The one who has called us into the world has overcome the world. We can face the future hopefully and confidently because it belongs to the one who calls us and it doesn't belong to us. We have responsibilities toward keeping it, toward the environment, toward making it a safer place for all people, for bringing love to all people. We were given that opportunity because Christ died for us on the cross. That victory was won right then and there. The resurrection affirms God's eternal triumph over evil and death. We look around and we see so much evil. We see so much death, sickness, disease, destruction, decay. That's not what God left us. God left us the responsibility and the task to love. And he knows that someday we'll be one with him. From out of this mess, we will come into oneness with God. Let us live triumphantly toward that world rather than this one. May we go all bow in prayer. Almighty God, who in your infinite confession made us in your own image and even redeems us as your children, we praise you for creating us with the potential to live as citizens of a new heaven and a new earth. Where justice conquers violence, love triumphs over hate. Hope drives out despair, and greatness is achieved through humble service. You have called and consecrated us to be agents of reconciliation in a fragmented world, to be channels of love in a world of hatred and violence, to be persons of integrity and goodness in a world that is entertained by betrayal and seduced by expediency. Through your mercy, forgive our failure to live, to live out our calling, and to live in your grace. Consecrate us as a new child, a child of your kingdom. We pray, pray for people throughout all the world, those that are suffering many things, terrible storms, disease. 
We pray for those that have no power and lack any potential and are often suppressed by those that are in power. Free us, O oh God, from all that prevents this world from becoming, from becoming the kingdom of our Lord and your Christ. Shatter our idols, purify our motives, shape our values, mold our relationships, liberate our minds so that our ordered lives will confess the beauty of your peace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, in whom we have been called and consecrated as a community of grace and goodness. The Christ who taught us the prayer to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory 